Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We are glad that you are here. Welcome to Bethel Christian Center. And we greet all of you here in person and those that are online watching. Dr. Pastor Don, Sister Josie, the Franks, and all the others who are online watching this morning. We just say, God bless you. Thank you for being a part of the service. You're here this morning. You're here this morning because of the grace of God. Amen. You're Amen. here this morning because God just saw fit to say he woke you up. You heard the alarm clock. He stirred you and you were able to move your limbs. You were able to get out of bed this morning. That's a good thing. And you had a sound mind because this morning you're here in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is such a good God. He is such a merciful God and his mercy is everlasting toward us. Amen. We are thankful this this morning. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless your holy name. We love you this morning. So would you stand with me? Would you stand with me? Because this morning, we're not going to be just spectators, but this morning, we're going to be worshipers. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your blood that runs warm in our veins, not because of our goodness, but Lord, because of your grace and mercy toward us. We bless you this morning, Father. We thank you for your goodness, for your kindness. Thank you that your love is chasing out for us. We're thankful for God that you gave us another opportunity to serve you, to bless you. We love you, Holy Spirit. We give your name the praise and the glory. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you are willing, come on forward as we start our praise and worship this morning.
await you to come on the clouds. We eagerly await you, Lord, to split the sky as your word declares. Everything we see, everything we know going on around us, Lord, all of it eventually under your feet, all of it subject to the Prince of Peace. And the word says his kingdom and his government shall have no end. Lord, this is our hope. This is why we sing to you this morning. This is why we love you this morning, God. We gather to realize that hope, to know that hope. Lord, to be washed in that hope. We thank you, God, in Jesus' mighty name.
remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. Sin separated, the reach was far too wide. From the far side of the castle, Behind heaven's throne, here and here inside. And as a cross, you pay the debt I owe. Let my chains be my soul for the first time I had hold. Thank you, Jesus, for.
Thank you for the blood. Glory thank you. Me. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, that everything we do here is in response to the sacrifice that you you made for us. We get to live in that. We get to live in the knowledge of that. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us about this blood that has been applied over every circumstance we enter into this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. While you're being seated, it's so fun to see new faces up on the stage, isn't it? Good job. <laughs> We're going to transition now into a time of offering. So if you are an usher today, if you want to go ahead and make your way forward. Um, and in the light of the blood that was shed for us, we give. And we give to make the work of the church happen. The ministry that happens here on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and even outside these walls would not be possible without the generosity of all of you who are sitting here. So I just encourage you to continue giving in this season where um, lots of places and people and organizations will bombard you with, with asks to give, and all of those are really good things. But if you would sow first into the church, I am sure you would be blessed for it. So let me pray over the offering, and we'll get started. Lord, thank you that you have blessed us here financially, spiritually, emotionally, but Lord, thank you for the, the financial blessing that is represented by the community of this church. I pray that you would take the little or the lot that we give today and just multiply it to glorify your name and to bring glory um, to your son and that we could do good ministry and good work here in Durham and that Durham would be changed because of you, because of our faithfulness and giving in this church. In Jesus' name, amen. also makes you want to just pull a Pastor Don and bust out into song, but I will spare you from that. <laughs> um, so y'all buckle in. We have a lot of things going on here at the church. Y'all know holiday season is busy and it is prime time for the church to have some fun events and fellowship. So we have a few that are on the bulletin, a few that are not. So if you want to take notes, by all means, go ahead. The first one is that the new devotional word for you today is available at the Welcome Center. So if you would like one of those, you can pick one up on your way out. Next, this is not on your bulletin, but next Wednesday, we do not have Wednesday evening service due to Thanksgiving. So you're welcome to show up, but the doors will probably be locked and it might be cold out there. So please don't come. <laughs> then on Sunday, November 6th, or not November 6th, November 26th, 
Following Thanksgiving, we have a holiday potluck here in the fellowship hall. There's a sign up on the foyer. You'll see lots of sign ups on the foyer. But if that one you will mark down, if you're coming, how many people in your family are coming and what food you plan to bring just so we can know how to set the room. But please come and join us. I think it'll be a really fun time. And then the following Wednesday, November 29th, so not this one, don't come, but the next one, do come and come early because we have a fundraising dinner. Um, Chris and Kristen and the team going to Mardi Gras will be serving a spaghetti dinner that will be ready between 6 and 6.15. If you come, it's donation-based. You get bread, spaghetti, salad, dessert, all that. So if you come, uh, make a donation, and then we will move on to our regularly scheduled service at 7 o'clock. And the pastors of Pioneers Church in downtown Durham are coming to share with us. So it'll be an evening you don't want to miss. And then... After that, trying to keep them in order. Friday, December 1st, is the Ladies' Ornament Exchange at Linda's house. And if you are a lady here at Bethel, you should come. Um, when me and Colin first came back from the field, he was like, we've got to go to Bethel. That's our church, obviously. And I was like, that's not my church. That's your church. And so I just had all types of feelings about it. But what sold me on becoming a member here at Bethel was the Ladies' Ornament Exchange. <laughs> Um, you all just loved on me so well, and I hope to turn around and do the same to some of the new faces we have here in our community this year and to welcome you in. But these ladies are um, fierce, but they're also friendly, um, and several of you went out of your way to give me kind gifts afterwards, and it was just, it was so meaningful, so thank you. You know who you are, um, but please come. Um, there's a sign-up for that, just so we know you're coming. There's a sign-up if you want to bring food. I checked it. The only thing missing is sausage balls, so if you're a lady and you can make really good sausage balls, please come, because I want those. Um, and then you can also drive yourself, so make sure you know on the right side of the sheet if you will be needing to ride the bus or if you plan on driving yourself. Um, okay, and then after that, I told y'all we have a lot going on. On December the 9th at 5 p.m., we have a Bethel Christmas party bus. I know. I'm very excited. Um, so we are going to meet here at the church. Anybody is welcome to sign up, but there's only enough spots for 25 people, including the driver. And I checked, there's eight spots left. So if you're interested, please run out to the foyer afterwards and sign up to come with us. We're going to leave the church as soon as the whole crew's here, head over to Pioneer's Coffee Shop, get a hot drink, whether it's coffee or a hot chocolate or something festive, and then we're going to tour the area and look at Christmas lights. So I'm very excited about that. Please come. I think it'll be really fun. And then last but not least, on Saturday the 16th, we have a flash choir for our Christmas service. So the sign-up sheet is on the Welcome Center, the choir and dinner, there's choir practice on the 16th for the service on the 17th. So it's one practice, one service, and they will feed you after the practice at Pomodoro's. Am I saying that right? Okay, so we just need a sign-up sheet to know how many people to plan for. So if you are interested in blessing us with your musical talent for Christmas, please sign up today. If you guys have any questions, you can come ask me or anyone on staff, um, and they can help explain a little bit better about all of these. But I'm looking forward to it, and I hope to see you at all of the things. Lots going on. That's the first time I've heard that story from Madison about the Ladies' Ornament Exchange. <clears throat> But, you know, it just uh, solidifies what studies often show is that the first time people come to a church, oftentimes it's not because they've got a dynamic pastor or a dynamic praise team or whatever. It's because somebody cared enough about them to invite them. Or maybe cared enough about them as a follower of the Lord to speak a kind word into their life. And that's why most of the time people will come into a fellowship. And if I hear anything over and over about Bethel by people who did visit us, it is that we are a kind church. We're a very welcoming church. People said, I felt welcomed there. And I'm glad of that. Uh, we've got sound teaching in this church. We always have. We've got sound musicians and uh, praise and worship, and we always have. But we've got people who love people. And that's what Christ came for. 
I'm glad for our beautiful building and all the things that we can do here. But Christ came for people. And I ask God not to let me get so busy with things that don't matter that I forget about people. And that's easy to do. That's easy to do. But thank you for being the type of church that you are. I'm glad that Madison going to something where all I hear is stories about ladies stealing each things from each other is what kept her to come to the church. But whatever it takes, we'll, we'll take it. <clears throat> a, um, one of the programs that we've been doing here all year, and I haven't mentioned it in a while, so I thought I would mention it this morning. We have adopted the Officer of the Month program in District 2. Our, our uh, church sits in District 2. Uh, and so each month, every district recognizes an officer of the month for outstanding work. And what we've done is uh, we have a $15 Chick-fil-A gift card that we, I write a little personal note. I drop it off at the substation to the officer who received the officer of the month. And the district commanders send me uh, 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 the justifications of why they were chosen that month. And so I thought I would share this with you. It says, on November 1st at 1234, Senior Officer Preston was dispatched to an unknown police problem at 1129 Briar Rose Lane. The victim told dispatch that a man was outside with a gun, and the call taker also heard gunfire through the phone. Officer Preston arrived on the scene and came into contact with the suspect, whom ran through the wood line, and he initiated a foot chase. Officer Preston was able to give a clear radio traffic of directions of travel along with the suspect description, and a short distance later arrested the suspect after an Article K-9 search, a 9mm handgun with an extended magazine was located nearby. The suspect was charged with possession of a firearm by a felon, assault by pointing a gun, discharging a firearm within the city limits, and resist and delay and obstruct an officer. Now some of you may be listening and think, man, that sounds scary. This guy was chasing someone with a gun. He's a convict convicted felon. Our officers do that all the time. And unfortunately, that's just not what you hear in the media. And so for that, Officer Preston was recognized as the Officer of the Month, and for that, we get to give him a personal note with a, a Chick-fil-A gift card that you're so gracious and you're giving to give. So I just, we will continue to do that Officer of the Month program. Uh, the officers really appreciate it. I do get a lot of feedback from the commanders just thanking our church uh, for doing that for them. As Madison said, no, no service next Wednesday night. Uh, next week, Pastor Farrell will be back in town. Uh, we'll have the privilege to meet his daughters. They're excited to come and meet you all. And so he'll be preaching for us uh, next week. And then I think he's going to be traveling some more. And I think around mid-December he will, he will be back for good. So excited about him and his family being back with us next weekend. This week uh, we're going we're gonna to finish. I'm going to finish not, not today but one more time out of James. It, it worked out good. So I will finish this just at the same time it appears that Pastor Farrell will be able to come in. And, and take over um, the church. But we're going to continue in the book of James. And it's been a challenge. Some of the things have been challenging to us. And last week we ended with the fact that our God is a God of justice. Last week James was pretty critical of the rich. And I think what we are quick to do sometimes is say, well, good, that doesn't apply to me, but it applies to us all in some ways. But one of the things he said was that the rich had become that way because they had held back the wages of their workers. But the Bible says that the cry of those who had been, who had been treated unjustly came up to the Lord of hosts, that he heard it. And he hears the cries of the unjust and of injustice. And I think when we hear the word social justice today, as Christians and sometimes labeled conservatives, we immediately put up a wall because social justice in some ways that word has been hijacked by some things that are not in line with the scriptures. But you can't read the book of Amos and not understand our God is a God of justice. He's concerned about the poor. He's concerned about unjust killing. He's concerned about unfair business practices. He's concerned about unfair courts and all those things. And we look around and we see so much injustice in our world today and we, it makes us angry and we don't feel like there's anything we can do about it. I can't do anything about this, God. And maybe you've been here today, maybe you've been treated unjustly for some reason. There's a good chance maybe you have. Maybe you've been treated unjustly because of your race. We have a history in our past of treating people unjustly because of their race. 
Maybe you've been treated unjustly because of your socioeconomic position. Maybe you've been treated unjustly because there was a court date that you had or something came up and you knew if I had more money, if I had more influence, this might would be a different outcome. And maybe it is. And so you cry out and you say, God, how come all the injustice? This is not right. Well, I'll tell you, James says the Lord hears your cries. He hears your cries. And that's the same thing he said to those in James 5 verse 4. But this morning what I want to do is talk about, but what? What are we supposed to do? Okay, Lord, he hears me, but what? He hears me, but what? And this is what he said in James 5 and 8, and I'll read the, the broader context in a little bit. He told those people, he said, you also be patient. You feel like you've been treated unjustly. You see injustice in the world. You know some things are going on that are not right. But you don't seem helpless. You seem helpless to do anything about it. This is what he says. You also be patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord is at hand. The coming of the Lord is at hand. You know, when I was putting this message together and pondering over it, when I thought about injustice here in our country, the first thing that came to my mind was this, Jack Phillips. Jack Phillips run a cake shop out in Colorado. All Jack Phillips wanted to do was run his business according to his conscience. And a couple came in, a same-sex couple, and said, would you bake a cake for our wedding? And Jack Phillips said, I'll, do, I'll sell you anything in my store, but I can't do that. I can't put a message on that violates my faith. And the full force of the Colorado government came after Jack Phillips. All kinds of hateful messages, threatening to sue him, threatening to take everything he's had. But Jack Phillips stood, stood strong. He stood strong. But how many times, I thought, did Jack Phillips get on his knees and say, God, this is just not right. Or I thought about Baronel Stutfin, who I had a chance to hear her in person. A grandmother who ran a florist for many years in, in the state of Washington. And had a good friend who used to come in and buy flowers from her in her flower shop. And he was a gay man. And they had a great relationship. And he was going to get married. So he came in and said, I'm getting married. I'm excited. I want you to do my flowers. And I want you to come to my wedding and handle my flowers. And she said, I can't do that. You know, I'll sell you anything in my store, but I can't do that. And the full weight and force of the state of Washington came after her threatened her to shut her down. She got all kinds of hateful messages. And, and, and I heard her story in person. It was just incredible to hear what she went through. And when she was in Raleigh, when I went there to hear her speak, and she had her ADF attorney with her, and somebody asked her, well, what happens? Her case also went to the Supreme Court. Jack K. Phillips' case went to the Supreme Court, and he won. But they still are hounding him. And they asked her, they said, what happens if you don't win? And this 70-something-year-old grandmother, her voice broke, and she said, this is where I will get emotional. I may lose everything me and my husband have worked so hard for. I'll lose my shop. We may lose our home. We may lose all of our life savings. And I was like, wow, God, this isn't right. This isn't right. But the Lord says to Baronel and says to Jack Phillips the same thing that he would say to us today. Be patient. The coming of the Lord is at hand. And so whether you've been mistreated or whether you hadn't, that's the word to James, from James to us, is that we be patient. That's hard for me. Can I tell you, sometimes I don't want to be patient. I want to get even. When I hear stories like that, I get angry. Like, Lord, I wish I could just get, get make the, I want to get even. Maybe that's just me, but that's our sin nature. If I had half a chance, boy, I'd straighten this thing out myself. I'm like James and John. Some Lord, can we call down fire from heaven and just finish this thing right now? It's not his nature. I'm glad his nature is not like my nature. So if you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to James 5, 7 through 12. James says, speaking to those people who've been treated unjustly, who their cries have come up to him. This is what James says. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the earth early and the latter rain. 
You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen that the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any oath. But let your yes be your yes and your no, your no, lest you fall into judgment. This morning's message will center around James 5 8. Be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Lord, I thank you for that hope. Lord, I thank you that no matter what's going on in the world, no matter how bad things seem, no matter how things they seem internationally, nationally, or right down at our level, we have a hope beyond this life, beyond this world, that God that just passes, that gives us a peace that passes understanding. And I thank you for that, Lord. As we look into what your word says about that return, in Jesus' name, amen. First thing James says is, he says, establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. That is a call from James to courage and resolve. It's a call to courage and resolve. I think about Daniel. Daniel was a young man, a young teenager. The nation of Israel is under the judgment of God and they're taken captive and they go to Babylon, a wicked nation. And Daniel's a young man and he's going into captivity. But Daniel, the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart. He made up his mind before he got to Babylon. I will not defile myself. I will not go into Babylon and, uh, and adopt their customs that are contrary to what my God tells me is right. And that took courage and resolve. And he had three friends that did the same thing. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when, God's, when, when the king of Babylon said, bow. And Nebuchadnezzar said, I built this statue. I want you to bow. And everybody else was bowing. And these three boys said, bless you, old king. My God's able to deliver me. But even if he don't, I ain't bowing. They had some strong even if faith. And I think we may have to have some even if faith. Here soon. But it is a call to courage and resolve. You will hear not this Wednesday night, but next Wednesday night from Daniel and Sheree Jackson. You have been so gracious to give to that church. And they're excited to come tell you their story at Pioneers Church. A young couple. The most humble people I've ever met in my life. And all they wanted to do was to start a church in downtown Durham. And, and share the gospel and share who Christ was. Right in the heart of really a dark area. And not long after they established that church, a couple comes in and says, we'd like for you to marry us, a same-sex couple. And they said, I can't do that. And literally, the gates of hell came against them. They had been launched by the Methodist church. The Methodist church disaffiliated with them, said, we're sorry we ever sent you down there. And it just got worse and worse and worse. But they had resolve and courage. And you'll hear that. And they stayed the course. And his wife would go out during the protests and say, why don't you just come talk to us? I got to tell you, folks, I probably would have packed my stuff and left. But they didn't. And they wanted to. But they stayed. And they're making inroads. They're making inroads into places that I may not have inroads in. But it took resolve and courage. And he goes in, he says, consider the prophets when you think about this. This idea of resolve and courage. Every generation during Israel, when they were away from God or when they would start worshiping false gods, he would send a prophet in the Old Testament. And most of the time they wouldn't hear him. Many times they tried to kill him. And he used Job in particular. James points out Job in particular and what he went through. And, and Job was doing well. Job was a pretty wealthy guy and everything was going great for Job. And Satan comes up and says to Says to the Lord, you know, the only reason Job serves you is because you bless him. Because he's got good stuff. If you let, let me take all this stuff away from him, he'll, he'll turn his back on you. And God says, okay, I'm going to let you take his stuff. Just don't, you can't take his life. And man, Job loses his children. He loses his money. He loses his cattle. He gets sick. 
Even his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? But Job stays true. He endures. He perseveres. He says, though God slay me, yet will I trust him. I ask myself that sometime. If all of a sudden that was my call, if God came in and said, Satan, you can take everything he's got. Just don't take his life. Would I say, though God slay me, yet will I trust him? I say that in faith. I hope so. And I believe God gives us supernatural faith when we need supernatural faith. And the time we build that kind of faith oftentimes is in the good times. And praying and seeking Him when it's not like that. And we build that spiritual muscle. But Job stayed true. And then James reminded us in 5.11, he said this, Indeed, we count them blessed, referring to the prophets, who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Boy, I'm glad of that. I'm glad he's compassionate and merciful. And he was compassionate and merciful to Job. The Bible says at the end, he restored Job twice as much as he had. And I get the, I get the pleasure to seeing that, reading that on the back end. But when Job was going through that, he couldn't see that. He just had to trust God in the midst of it. So we have to establish our hearts. We have to be prepared for suffering and be patient when things aren't going our way. And really what that boils down to is endurance. The Bible speaks often of endurance. I sent out an email this week. I hope you had a chance to read Matthew 24. I'll make several references to Matthew 24. But after the disciples had come and wanted to know when these things were going to happen, when was the end of the age, and we still want to know that, don't we? We've been debating that for years. And I'm going to get into some of the debates in this in just a moment. We want to know, Lord, when's this going to happen? And that's what the disciples wanted to know. And Jesus goes through these things that wars and rumors of wars and famine and pestilence and earthquakes and false prophets and all these things. But then he says this in 24, 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He endures to the end shall be saved. And in every single letter to the churches in Revelation, Jesus says this, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes, to him who overcomes. And I think about the endurance, I think about the tribulation, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and some of the terrible things that are happening. But right now, church, that's not what I have to endure. Right now, what I have to endure and you have to endure is I have to endure to make sure that I continue to fight my flesh that wants to do things and not do things. I have to continue to endure when Satan wants to get in my ear and say, you're not good enough. Why do you keep doing this? You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. You're just not good enough. I have to endure. I have to remind myself of who I am in Christ. I might have to endure some suffering here. Some of you are enduring going through physical sickness. Some of you are going through enduring the trials of life now. There may have been times you want to throw your hands up and say, I'm done with all of this. That's what we have to endure sometimes. And we see things happening in our families, sickness, sorrow, trouble, that makes us sometimes want to shrink back and turn back. But Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be saved. Establish your hearts, he said, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Every generation since the ascension has believed that the Lord was soon to return. Everyone. That's what prompted James, uh, Paul to write 1 Thessalonians, which I'll deal with in a moment, about the, this, the most well-known scripture of the rapture. Because those people thought the Lord was coming. Paul, you said he was coming back, but our people are dying. What happened to him when they die? He's not come back yet. So every generation thinks he's soon to return. I look at what's going on around today, and I think, Lord, it's got to be soon. I mean, I see... Alliances forming around the world. I see that it appear to be coming against the nation of Israel. I see alliances forming between Russia and China. I see the degradation, degradation of the things here in the United States. I see great apathy in the church. So Lord, is this, is this soon? But then I think about the believers that would have lived during World War II. Don't you think they thought the sin was coming? Hitler is... I'm not trying to annihilate the Jews. He's a madman on the world stage. There's a world war. To be sure, they thought, Lord, it's got to be soon. It's got to be now. We don't know. We don't know. 
and every generation has thought it was soon. And it could be. It could be tomorrow. However, many believe that the establishment of Israel as a nation in May of 1948 really was a big click on the prophetic clock. Once that nation was established as a nation, many believe that nothing else necessarily has to happen for a return of Jesus Christ, which leads into the idea of the imminency of his return. In other words, it could be now. Now, there are some that believe about the Lord's turn that there is some other things that have to happen. I'll deal with momentarily. But many believe it could happen right now. That we could hear, we sang about that this morning. We sang about that trumpet. That we could hear a trumpet sound right now. So when is he coming? This idea of the return of the Lord has been one of the most hotly debated issues in Christianity. Since he left. Since he ascended up. There's been debates. And so I want to deal with two things this morning. I want to deal with this idea of the rapture, and I want to deal with this idea of the second coming. And I, I, uh, I've listened to people debate these issues, church, that are a whole lot smarter than me. They have been studying and reading the scriptures a whole lot longer than I have. That come to different con- conclusions on when some of these things happen. And so I'm not here to tell you what to believe about these things. You may say, well, what does Bethel believe? Our church says that we believe in the visible body return of Jesus Christ. That's what we believe. These other things, I believe, are things where the Bible says, let's just come reason together. Let's sit down and talk about this a minute. And I love to listen to people who are willing to listen to each other debate these things. And not say, well, you're wrong, and I'm right, and I'm right, and you're wrong. But the rapture. The most well-known scripture for this idea of the rapture is 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. Paul writing to a church at Thessalonica, like I said, people have died. They thought the Lord was going to return before this happened. And this is what he says to them. But I do not want you to be ignorant, my brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. And then there's another scripture that's often used, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised and incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So as I talk about these end time things that people debate, this is a very broad overview of this. You could study this and some have their whole life and still have some questions about these things. But this idea of the rapture, the, what's, what's debated in it, the word rapture is never mentioned in the Bible. The actual word rapture is never mentioned. The word that's used is harpazo. It's a Greek word that means to be to snatch away. If you remember in this passage of scripture, Paul said that those of us who remain will be caught up. That's the Greek word, caught up, to snatch away. It's used 14 times, only in the New Testament, only in this context of going up. In other places, it's used in a different context. But but what's debated in this idea of the tribulation is when, or the rapture, is when does this occur? And the debate centers around primarily three debates. It's called pre-tribulation. Mid-tribulation and post-tribulation. Pre-tribulation being that the Lord is going to return with that shout, with that trumpet. And, the day, and it's going to be uh, uh, only visible to the believers. And that the dead are going to rise first. And that we who are alive are going to go up with him. We're going to meet him in the air. He's going to take us to heaven. And then there's going to be seven years of tribulation. Many people believe that. Good, godly people believe that. And it's okay. 
And then there's mid-tribulation. There's those who believe that after the first three and a half years of the tribulation period, which is seven years, Jesus will return. And the same thing will happen. And then the great tribulation. And then there's post-tribulation. There's those who believe that the church is going to go through the tribulation. And then Jesus is going to return. We're going to go up just like they would before. But then we're going to come back down onto earth and set up his kingdom for the millennial reign. Who's right? David Jeremiah is very much a, a pre-tribulation guy. I would not dare look at David Jeremiah and say, you're wrong. I, I wouldn't. I like to follow behind. You guys know I listen to a guy named Michael Brown. Messianic Jew. Been studying his scriptures the whole life. He is 100% post-tribulation. And both of them give strong arguments. I'm not going to look at Michael Brown and say, you're wrong. I'm not. And they can't both be right. But is that the bigger issue? No. The bigger issue is this. He's coming back. He's coming back. And I have to be ready. There's two things that we should take out of this. One, we have to be prepared to endure and suffer. No matter what. No matter when this happens. No matter what. And part of my concern for many years, and I think this might be changing a little bit in the church as we see what's going on, is the good old coddled American Christian says, well, hold on a minute. God knows I'm an American Christian. Before I have to suffer, before I have to make a decision for anything, he's going to take me out of here. Don't be so sure about that. Don't be so sure about that. And there's others who say there's a difference between tribulation and his wrath. And I, I agree with that. Michael Brown, he, the reason, how he, one of the main ways he justifies that, he says it's been God's nature and pattern through the history not to remove his people from tribulation, but to keep them in it. He didn't pull Noah out when he flooded the earth. He had him built an ark. He didn't snatch the nation of Israel out of the Red Sea. He parted it. He didn't pull them out when the angel of death come. He said, put this blood over the doorpost. Who's right? Who's wrong? Church, I don't know. But I know this. And the, answer, the thing for me and the thing for you is, are you ready? Have you surrendered yourself to Christ? Because these things that are going to happen during the tribulation are really going to happen. They're really going to happen. And, and whether or not you're taken out of here in a rapture before all those things come or not, because I'll ask you a question. If, you, if I said to you, the Lord has spoken to me, and, and this has actually happened before. You know, some guy wrote a book in 88, said 88 reasons why Christ is going to return in 1988. And people believe that nonsense. And then when it didn't happen, he wrote a follow-up. Well, I got it wrong, so it's going to be 1990. And when it didn't happen then, I think he finally went away after that. Nobody knows when these things are going to happen. Jesus said we can see the signs, we can see the seasons. But we don't know when they're going to happen. But if we did, if you knew it was going to be tomorrow at 5 o'clock, what would you do between now and then? And if there's an answer to that for you, why aren't you doing that now? Because it could be. It could be. And there's, I have no guarantee that between now and tomorrow at 5 o'clock that he's not going to call me out of this earth. And I'm going to stand before him. And so the when and hows is not as important as... It's going to happen. I mention this word tribulation a lot. So I just, the tribulation is seven years like the world has never seen. If you read Matthew, if you read Matthew 24, 3 through 28, Jesus describes the tribulation. And you can read that on your own. And you can read most of Revelation where they deal with seal judgments, trumpet judgments, bowl judgments. It's a time of natural and supernatural calamity like the world has never seen. But when you read the scriptures, and there's something in there about the second coming, the return of the Lord, most, most, most of the time, it's going to be referring to the second coming of the Lord. And some people don't, they, get, they don't realize that. We talk so much about this rapture. What those scriptures talk most about is the second coming of Christ. When every eye is going to see him, when every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord. 
I told you there were 14 references to this idea of harpazo in the New Testament only. There's 1,845 biblical references to the second coming of Jesus. More than eight times more than than, than to the references to his first coming, which is at Christmas. 1,845. If there's, and we're going to all celebrate Christmas because we know that happened. But I'm going to tell you, the second coming is going to happen too. And there's a whole lot more references to that one than it was to his first coming. Jesus describes what that'll be like in Matthew 24, 29 through 31. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to the other. That's going to happen. The Bible says he lo- that he longs for those who love his appearing. I hope I get to see that. I'd like to be alive when that happens. Can you imagine what that is going to be like? That trumpet's going to sound, and he's going to step out on the world stage. I find it interesting the Bible says the nations will mourn. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to go, uh-oh. Them rapture nuts ain't so crazy after all. But it might be too late for them. And if I've gone up, I believe when he steps out on the world stage, I step out with him. That's going to happen. I have hope in that. And when I think about that happening, and when you think about that happening, when you start to think about what you might be enduring now, you start to think about what you may endure, you might think about the sickness, you may about think about things that's been unfair in your life, none of that stuff's going to matter then. None of that stuff's going to matter then. After that second coming, there's the millennial reign. I won't spend much time. I'm not going to spend any time on that. Hotly debated. So a thousand years of reign of Jesus. There's different opinions on that too. Of how and when and how that happens. But we believe in a millennial reign. But at the end of that millennial reign, there's a great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 says this. Then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it, and whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. I told you that the cry of injustice, injustice comes up to the Lord. And he keeps good accounting. He keeps good accounting. The books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. It's kind of scary for me sometimes to think I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an accounting for my works. But I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. If you're here and you're a believer, you're following the Lord, we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's where we'll receive rewards. Rewards will be taken away. How does that work? I don't know. But I believe it. And you know what it does? It compels me to want to live holy before the Lord. It compels me to want to care about people. It compels me to want to share that gospel. It compels me to want to not be one of those who've mistreated people along the way. Because I know I'm going to stand before the ultimate judge and give an account for it. The sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me ask you something. Is your name written in the book of life this morning? I hope it is. It can be. For you leave here today if it's not. It can be. Because these things are going to happen. How do you get your name in there? Are you good enough? Do you work hard enough to get your name in there? Uh uh-uh. uh. Do you, do, or can you be bad enough where God just says, You've just been too bad, you cannot get your name in there? Uh uh-uh. uh. Do you just live a good life and He's going to put your name in the book of life? Uh uh-uh. uh. 
When you feel the tug of that Holy Spirit, and I believe there's people today who feel that tug and they brush it off, and they, I've got time, and I don't know if I believe this, but when you, because this is all the work of the Holy Spirit. This is not the work of Larry. But I know I felt that tug before. I still feel it. When I feel like I'm getting maybe in the areas where the Lord has to smack me and bring me back in. I still believe in the conviction of the Holy Spirit for the believer. But when he begins to tug at that heart and you come down and surrender yourself, you can do it in your, at your pew. You don't have to come down here. Although I miss those days when people would swallow their pride and say, I get to get things right with God. And you just come down and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Your standard is perfect, holiness, perfect righteousness and the only way I can stand before you is in perfect holiness and perfect righteousness and I can't do it but your son did it he died on a cross he took my sin and I received that and then that blood that we read about is applied right here and when he looks down the only deed he sees in my life that determines whether or not I'm in heaven or hell is the blood of Jesus that's it don't make it about anything other than that and if that's really happened, that'll set you on a course that'll change your life. It'll change your life. The great white throne judgment. And then it, when it's all over, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. John said in Revelation 21, 1 through 2, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And that's it. That's where I'm going to spend eternity, is in that new heaven and that new earth. Hopefully with you. I want to spend it with you, believe that or not. I don't know about you, David. And folks, we have no idea what that's going to be like. God has, says that eye has not seen or ear heard what he has prepared for us. And as I thought through this, this all started with this idea of injustice. I ain't been treated right. And Lord, I want you to make things right. And he will. He's going to open these books and he's going to make it right. But I have a feeling if I've been mistreated or if you've been mistreated, I have a feeling once I step into the portals of heaven, I step into the presence of Almighty God, all what may or may, or may not have happened to me on this earth ain't going to matter one bit. I ain't going to care a thing about that. Because there's going to be joy unspeakable, full of glory for eternity. So when does all this happen? Is it pre-trib, post-trib, amillennial, post-millennial, pre-millennial? When does all this stuff happen? I don't know. But Jesus said this to his disciples, which leads me into the close. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's a call to us, church. That's a call to us. He's left his church here today to preach this good news to all the nations, to your neighbor, to your co-worker. In this study of James, this book of works, my question to you is if you believe this, When's the last time you had a conversation with someone that you loved? Because Jesus said this gospel was going to be, and then the end will come. So how do we live? How do we live while we are waiting? First, James in uh, chapter 5, verse 9, he says, look, don't grumble against one another. I'm afraid what's happened is it's been so long since the Lord, it's been over 2,000 years now. And every generation has thought he's coming, and we've gotten apathetic. And in and, and all of chapter 25 of Matthew, you read that next, is what that's about. The first is the ten virgins. He said there was five, five uh, foolish and five wise. And the five wise had plenty of oil in their lamp. And the five foolish didn't. And the Bible says there was a midnight cry. And they all jumped up. And the five foolish ones was running and they couldn't make it because their lamps were running out. And they asked the ones that had oil, said, give us some of your oil. And they said, uh-uh, because if we give you ours, we won't make it. And the five foolish ones, by the time they went and got oil and came back, it says that the door was shut. I think they got apathetic. I mean, he ain't come back in 2,000 years. I mean, what's the chances he's coming back tomorrow? 
Don't start grumbling. Don't start getting fussing and fighting over pre trib and post trib and the color of the carpet and the length of the service and this and that and all this stuff that don't matter. Let's stay close to the Lord and let's get out there and do what Jesus said and preach the gospel. Well, Larry, I'm not the preacher. You're the preacher right now. Wrong. All of you are preachers. You got influence with people I don't have influence with. But we grumble. We get, we get apathetic. So let's don't grumble. Let's don't grow weary in well-doing. Jesus in Matthew 24, 45 through 47 told the difference between a faithful servant and an evil servant. And this is what he said of the faithful servant. He said, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler of his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him doing. What Jesus is saying there is, look, I'm going away. And the servant that's going to be faithful is when I come back, I find him about the kingdom's business. You remember what he told Peter at the end? He said, Peter, do you love me? Uh -huh. Asked him three times, huh? What do you say to him? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And Jesus is saying here, the faithful servant, if we're faithful servants, we're found while we're waiting doing the kingdom business. Coming to church, witnessing, being a blessing to the poor, whatever it is, singing on the praise team. But we just don't get apathetic. And then the evil servant, he said, is the one who says, you know, my master's delayed in coming. So I'm going to beat my fellow servants. I'm going to eat and drink with the drunkards. So I ain't worried about it. I, ain't, I don't know about this rapture stuff no more. And Jesus said it's going to happen just like that. And that man will be cut to pieces and thrown out with us weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. So let's don't grow weary in well-doing. Let's don't shrink back. Hebrews 10, 37 through 39 says, For yet a little while... And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. In a little while. Now, the Bible tells me that a day is as a thousand years with the Lord. So I don't know what a little while means to him. But yet for a little while, he's going to come back and not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith. So while we wait on him to come, we live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. Or evil, but to those who believe to the saving of the soul. Don't shrink back, church. It's going to get a little bit harder, I predict, to be, in a, be a follower of Christ here in America. Don't shrink back. I know you might get unfriended on Facebook. I know you might not get invited to the office parties. I know they may call you names. Don't shrink back. It might seem he's tearing, but at just the right time, he's going to come. And I want to be found faithful. I'm going to ask Matt and the team to come up. What do we do with all this information? I mean, I, th these are, this is a very, very broad overview of end time doctrine. Eschatology, they call it. Big word. And I like to hear people talk about it. I love to study it and read it and all those things. But here's the main thing I want you to do with it. And this is what I, want, I think Paul wanted you to do with it. Life can be difficult sometimes. And many of you are enduring some things. Maybe you lost loved ones in the Lord and you're grieving them. Maybe you're struggling today with a sickness or an illness. Or maybe your, your child is away from the Lord and you just don't know what to think. You just don't know what to think. When it comes to these end times things and the faithfulness of God, Paul ended that encouragement to the church of Thessalonica, telling us how the Lord's going to descend with the trump and the shout and all those things I look forward to. We're going to go up. And... But he said, this is the purpose for it. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So I hope these words, although challenging, although sometimes I think scary, I hope they comfort you. I hope they comfort you. Because whether you've been mistreated at some point in your life, whether there's things that's happened you don't understand, whether you look around in the world and say, God, I see things happening that are not fair. He's coming back. 
And I get to go with him. Because of the blood. I'm going to tell you, it sure ain't because of Larry. And my desire for you, and it's always been the desire for this church and any church, is if you're not prepared for that, and you feel the prick of the Holy Spirit in your heart. See, I'm not going to talk you into it. That's not my desire here. One pastor I like to listen to said this, if I can talk you into it, someone else can talk you out of it. And that's a fact. And I'm going to tell you something. There ain't a person in here, there ain't the wisest theologian in the world, there ain't the biggest philosopher in the world that can talk me out of my salvation. I know who I am in Christ. I know what I believe. I've been in His Word. I've experienced His holy presence. I know who I am in Him. I know that when that trumpet sounds, no matter where it is, I'm going with Him and I am going to forever be with the Lord. And I know there's an alternative to that. And I, as Max Licato said last Wednesday night, I don't like plan B. And you don't hear much about plan B anymore, but there's a real hell. And Jesus mentioned it a lot. And he don't want no one to go there. The re, the, he cared so much that people wouldn't go there that he came and went to a cross. God sent his son to die on a cross and says, now whoever will. I would that not none would perish, the Bible says, but that all would come to a saving knowledge of God. And I, my desire is that everybody I know does that. But it's not my work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So while they play softly in the back, if you're here this morning, this altar is open. Brother Matt and I had a conversation, as we always do, about how to end the service. You know, and there's times I've talked with Pastor Don through the years, and I don't know, maybe I'll talk with Pastor Farrell one of these days. That, that's, you know what, this is the toughest part of this for me sometimes. Because sometimes I wonder, did anybody hear what I said? Does it matter? Do you get it? How do we finish this? Do we, we call for salvation and then we just go home? Or do we call everybody up? And, and what, is, what is the purpose of it all? Well, the purpose of it is that to give time for the Holy Spirit to do His work. And so I'm going to ask everybody in this place to bow your head, close your eyes, or just close your eyes. And I'm just going to pause a minute and let the music play and give the Holy Spirit a minute to move his, to do His work. If you're here and your heart's being pricked, if something's pulling at you, maybe you're not white knuckled on that pew in back of you, in front of you, but maybe you, you are. Maybe you don't have them up there, but you know I need to get up and I need to get some things right. Now's the time. Someone will meet you here and pray with you. I thank you for your presence that's been in this place. I thank you for what is often referred to as the blessed hope. A lot of people are looking for hope today. They're looking for hope in the government. They're looking for hope in their money. They're looking for hope in their youth. Looking for hope in uh, their earthly relationships. Their mere material possessions. God, in all those things you've, you've given us to enjoy, but not to place our hope in. Because every one of those things that I just mentioned are passing away. Only your kingdom is eternal. And yes, Lord, like many generations before me, I believe it's at hand. I find myself sometimes standing in my driveway looking up and saying, Lord, what if it happened right now? And it fills me with joy and it fills me with terror at the same time. And I say, Lord, if there's any evil in me, if there's any wickedness in me, Lord, forgive me of my sin. And Lord, prick my heart for the lost. I must admit, I, I'm, I'm not that concerned as I should be about the lost. 
Because if I really believe these things are going to happen, I need to be sharing it. And so I thank you for the congregation this morning, Lord. I, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for this church. And, and maybe there's someone here who's, you are pricking that heart. And they, they just don't want to come down. You, you save, there, there's testimonies of you saving people in all kinds of places. But if you're working in the heart of someone, I just pray, Lord, that they will surrender themselves to you. Your word says when you, we hear your voice. And it, it's not an audible voice most of the time. It's just something deep down in our spirit. It says don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart. So I pray, Lord, if you're ministering in someone's heart, that they won't harden their heart. But they'll know that, Lord, a relationship with you is, oh, yeah, it, it punches my ticket for heaven. But I don't want that to be what my relationship is about with you. That's a very unfulfilled relationship. I hope they can experience life and life more abundantly here. Because there's life abundantly lived with you here on earth. You've given us wonderful things to enjoy. You've blessed us beyond measure here in America. And I'm afraid that's been part of what's made us so apathetic. We've gotten a narrow view of the kingdom of God. I'm afraid we've narrowed your kingdom all the way down to our own little world right where we are. God, and we hadn't opened in our eyes and looked up on the horizon where you looked and said the fields are white under harvest and the laborers are few. God, forgive me for not being a laborer as I should. As we go into the Thanksgiving season, Lord, I thank you for my nation. I thank you for my family I thank you for your blessing on my life but most of all I thank you for the cross I thank you Lord I couldn't save myself I, I can't save myself and I thank you Lord that even now when something creeps into my life that don't need to be there your Holy Spirit comes in and begins to convict me and Many times I fall on my knees and where I stop where I'm at and I say, Lord, forgive me. I'm glad your word tells me that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and all unrighteousness. And then the longer I've walked with you and experienced your faithfulness, Lord, I, I see that the many things often that prevent us from coming to you, the things that we say, well, I don't know if I can stop this or I can stop that, that the longer we walk with you, the less those things mean to us. And we really do just want to live life with you and in your presence. Thank you for that. I thank you for salvation. I'm going to ask uh, the team to play uh, Thank You for the Blood Applied. I, I don't often know the titles of these songs, but... And I'm just going to ask everyone, if you will, let's just end with a time of worship here. And if you will, just stand and come forward. And before they, as we come down, before they, before they start, I, you know, oftentimes what I see is I see sometimes people don't come down. They don't raise their hand for a particular need, but there are needs. And, and many of you can minister to people better than I can. We have relationships in this church. That's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about people. It's about relationships. It's about having someone that you can go to and say, man, I need prayer. Sometimes that's the pastor. Oftentimes it's a fellow brother, sister in the Lord. So before they start singing this song, I'm going to ask, is there anybody in here that has a need? This you said, raise your hand and say, I just need somebody to pray with me. Whatever that need may be. Lisa, I get some ladies to play, pray with Lisa. Anyone else? Well, as they sing that song this morning, I just want you to worship. Nobody came forward. I'm assuming that blood's applied to you. And as we move into the Thanksgiving season, you cannot be more thankful for anything than that. Because, because of that blood, I get to live eternally in the presence of God. 
But God, help me now while I'm here, not to sit back on my laurels and just say, okay, God, I'm just going to wait for you to get here. But let me do what he commanded me to do and go out and be a good servant and share this message as they sing. Oh, oh.